I'm Scott Sagan, a senior fellow here at the Freeman Spogling Institute and CSAC and professor of political science. It's my great pleasure to uh, welcome you to this special seminar today featuring Daniel Ellsberg, Lynn Eaton, talking on the doomsday machine. Um, Dan Ellsberg needs no introduction. It's my pet peeve that whenever someone says that, they usually give a very long introduction. <laughs> so I'm not going to do that. I think all of you know his role in the Pentagon Papers and the anti-war movement during Vietnam. Only the game theorists and nuclear strategy scholars among you know of his important role writing the seminal pieces on the theory and practice of blackmail and his game theoretic work on ambiguity aversion, what's known in the field as the Ellsberg Paradox. And until this book came out, only those of us who had the great pleasure of talking to Dan about his experiences in the Pentagon understood the role that he played trying to understand and reform the U.S. nuclear war planning process. Um, that is what this book is about. It's an ongoing project. I think Dan would be the first to admit that there's still many challenges and many controversies that need to be discussed in a very open manner, which is exactly why we're going to be doing this today. Dr. Ellsberg will be in conversation with Dr. Lynn Eden, Senior Scholar Emeritus here at CSAC and the author of the magisterial and award-winning book, Whole World on Fire. After Dr. Eden and Dan Ellsberg have their dialogue, We'll be opening it up for questions and comments. I'll be taking a list and calling on individuals, and I, all I ask is that you ask one, not multiple questions, uh, and that you identify yourself and your affiliation. So without further ado, Dan Ellsberg and Lynn Eden. Uh, I'm Lynn Eden. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Scott, and you've done some of my introductions, which Dan will be very relieved at because he does not want to talk about the Pentagon Papers. He doesn't want us to talk about the Ellsberg Paradox. He doesn't want us to talk about his career at Harvard. Uh, um, so I'm going to uh, just mention a, a couple of your books, not the Pentagon Papers, which of course uh, I don't have right here. But uh, years and years ago, Dan wrote a book called Secret. Uh, I'm sorry, he wrote, he wrote a book on the, on, what was it called? Do, uh, Papers on Pentagon? the War. Papers on the War, I think 1972. I remember reading it, and, and Dan argued that uh, the U.S. was not in a quagmire. This in Vietnam, it isn't that the U.S. had just kind of stepped in and couldn't figure out how to get out. He said it was really about domestic politics and that no president wanted to lose the war during his watch. And I couldn't believe it. I just couldn't be that cynical. But years have passed, and I now, uh, I, I, have, I long ago became completely convinced of that. Then he wrote a book called Secrets, which is really magnificent. Uh, uh, for undergraduate or graduate teaching, or if you want to know how the government works, there's just nothing as, as detailed and vibrant about how it really works, about how your boss might put a hair on his files to know if you went into them. Uh, it, it's just, it's a really gripping read. Uh, and It's just terrific. And now we have the doomsday machine, which is all that you want to talk about, which is fine since many of us here are really pretty interested in nuclear weapons and nuclear weapons policy. So uh, uh, let me ask you a few questions. Uh, uh, and, uh, and then we'll open it up. And as we discussed, if you want to deviate from the few questions I have here, uh, just let me know. We can work it out together. Uh, so uh, why don't you first tell us a little something about how it is that the world knew about the Pentagon Papers in 1971 but not some other documents that you had. Do you want to tell us a little bit sure. about just what you were copying? Well, from really days or weeks after I started copying the Pentagon Papers, top secret history of the war, 47 volumes, 7,000 pages, at a time when I believed that the war was, I knew uh, from inside work, from Morton Halpern, John Paul Van, and others that Nixon did not intend to get out of the war with a 
loss for the United States. And what he meant by honor was to continue our ally or puppet General Chu in power through his second term. In other words, what some people thought he had in mind as a decent interval was not six months or a year and a half or two years. It was really eight years. Uh, and then he would leave office with General Chu in Saigon in power. And hopefully, and he actually achieved this without US ground troops uh, anymore, but uh, with US air power. And actually, he did achieve that. When he left office, General Chu was in power. And I think the war would not have ended uh, without Nixon out of office. But I didn't have that aim in mind, uh, actually, when I put out the Pentagon Papers or when I copied them. However, at the same time that I was copying those, I was also copying all the contents of my top secret safe at RAND. I was one of the few people at RAND who did have a top secret safe in my office, didn't have to go to the top secret control office to read stuff. And that reflected in part the fact that I had the bootleg copy of the Pentagon Papers, which was not entered into our top secret files by the order of the people who gave it to us, actually, Paul Warnke, uh, Mort Halpern, Les Gelb, did not want it entered into the files because they were afraid that if LBJ or his out of office or uh, Walt Rostow learned that there was such a study of our decision making, they would track it down and destroy it. So there was an agreement that this would not be entered into files and show up in the records. But I was the single person that Rand authorized to be reading it. I had worked on the study and had been given uh, permission to read the whole 47 volumes for comparative patterns of decision making in Vietnam. Yeah, why don't you say something about who started this secret study? Well, that's, what, that's the old story. Oh, of, all right. Pardon okay. me. Of uh, McNamara had decided to do a case study of what a failure in Vietnam, essentially. He didn't use that word, but he, that was uppermost in his mind. How had we gotten into this and uh, what could be learned from it for future people who had access to top secret documents? Uh, it came from, I think, his own work in the Harvard Business School on case studies as a way of learning entrepreneurship and learning executive uh, decision making and so forth. The point was, though, that I decided that what needed more urgently to get, or rather, more importantly, rather, to get out was the information that I gathered over years working on nuclear command and control uh, for St. Pac, Commander in Chief Pacific, study done by Office of Naval Research uh, in the late 50s and later in the Pentagon on nuclear war planning. And that work on command and control and the either authorized or unauthorized use of nuclear weapons by people uh, who were in the, uh, had access to nuclear weapons, led to my being asked to do the revisions, do a revised version of what was called the Basic National Security Policy, which was the guidance for the annual operational war plans from the president. Now, in the end, Kennedy decided not to issue a BNSP, a Basic National Security. He didn't want to commit himself to a particular strategy, which could be leaked or whatever. But it was what I drafted uh, in that form as guidance for the war plans was adopted by Secretary of Defense McNamara and sent to the Joint Chiefs of Staff in 1961 as Secretary of Defense guidance for what was then called the Joint Strategic Capabilities Plan, Annex C, was the war plan, for the war plan. And it was a, a very strong revision of the Eisenhower plan, uh, which we had inherited. And that's what I wanted to get to, what concerned me about this. I knew probably as well much, as much about that planning as any civilian at that time, uh, young as I was. The route I'd gotten into it uh, on the command and control work and then on nuclear war planning. And I'd read the earlier war plans, especially in the Pacific, but also the Joint Strategic Capabilities Plan, which was the JSCAP, which was very little known and was meant to be very little known by civilians in the Pentagon. And I briefed McGeorge Bundy, the assistant to national, for national security to President Kennedy, in his first month, actually, on what needed changing or what the properties were of the Eisenhower plan, which was a very, very strange plan in some ways in the history of war planning. Uh, for example, 
uh, it had allowed no existence of reserves of any kind uh, for strategic forces in the event of war with the Soviet Union. And I should also mention that war with the Soviet Union, meaning anything above a skirmish, say in the Berlin cor corridor, of a company or two companies, anything up to, say, a brigade, was regarded as, defined as, general war. That was armed conflict with Soviet forces. And there was one plan, essentially, for dealing with that. As I say, it allowed for no decision making by the president during the war or after the first uh, decision to go to war was involved. It really involved trucking uh, thermonuclear weapons by that time, by the late 50s, as many as we had and as fast as we could by all available planes as they came available out of training or maintenance or whatever, including the alert forces, over to hit every city in Russia and the USSR and China. Although the major number of targets were listed as military targets, bases, uh, air defenses, command and control, most of these or many of these were in cities. And in any case, the cities themselves were all targeted. That only accounted for some hundreds of weapons out of thousands that were to go. But the plan also called for hitting every city in China. Now, as I've said, general war was defined by armed conflict with the Soviet Union, in which case we would execute an ex a C, or what came to be known in 61 as the PSYOP, the Single Integrated Operational Plan, PSYOP 62, with the 62 referring to the end of the fiscal year, which would be uh, in end of June uh, 1962. This was now 61. <clears throat> Why China? Well, Sino-Soviet bloc, in theory, although that had been questionable from the late 50s and especially by 60 or 61, uh, that whether there was a Sino-Soviet bloc, actually. But the idea was, in, in particular in the Pacific, uh, if you're going to be at war with Russia, you don't want China to be at the side inheriting the Earth, basically, as China, as US and Russia destroyed each other. China was to be hit, too, as well. That seemed to me uh, a very, very strange, uh, well, let's, uh, condemnable, let me say, idea. General Shoup, uh, the commandant of the Marine Corps, when he was briefed on this plan, as I describe in the book, uh, raised the question. He said uh, at SAC headquarters, he said, killing X number, and I'll get to that, of Chinese when it's not even their fight is not a good plan, as the PSYOP had been described up till that point. He said, it's not a good plan. That is not the American way. But it was the American plan. And one thing that I thought that Bundy, just one of a number of things that Bundy needed to be told about at that point, was this determination to hit China, no matter how the war had started, over West Berlin, over conceivably Yugoslavia at that time, or Iran, or over an uprising in the East uh, Europe that had uh, escalated and somehow NATO had gotten involved. The Joint Chiefs thought of that, by the way, as a, as a very considerable possibility, more likely than a surprise attack uh, by the Soviets, which was the, the latter was the total focus of the RAND Corporation that I'd come from, deterring or responding to being able to respond to a Soviet surprise attack. The late 50s were the years of the missile gap, supposedly, when the Russians, who were the first to have launched an ICBM uh, shortly before they launched Sputnik, which showed, demonstrated to the world that they had this capability, uh, were thought to have many, many more ICBMs than the US had or would have, that they were, the gap was even going to increase in the future. And by 61, when I was writing, uh, there was some question was being raised in early 61 as to whether the gap was as large as people thought. But the Air Force continued, and CIA actually continued to say that they probably had something like 160, some said 120, 160 uh, ICBMs at a time when we had 40. But they were predicted to be going into hundreds within a year or two. Uh, I was at SAC headquarters in August of 1961 talking to the chief of war plans, Dave Liebman, that I'd known in the Pentagon, actually about their response to the new revised moder uh, plans that I had drafted and had just been sent down to them. And uh, in the course of that, Liebman mentioned to me 
You know what the old man here uh, thinks that Tommy Power, the commander of SEC, believes they have? No, tell me. He said, a thousand. This is a time when they had, we had 40 uh, Atlas and Titan ICBM, and plus about 120 Polaris missiles at sea, plus uh, Thor and Jupiter uh, in Italy and Turkey, and uh, uh, several thousand planes within range of Russia. Okay, at that time. But the idea still was they have a thousand ICBMs. A month later, the Discover Corona satellites had confirmed, had finally had adequate coverage of the possible launch sites in Russia, and had uh, concluded that what the Russians had at that time was four <laughs> ICBMs at one site on Plesetsk, four slow liquid-fueled missiles, very vulnerable to a single plane, basically, close to nothing which meant, by the way, that they had not tried to have a superiority in numbers of missiles to us. They could have done so with their big, clumsy SS-6, but chose not to do so. And that was about the only time they could have had a real first strike capability against our forces in the US. Nevertheless, they did have several hundred uh, weapon missiles, medium range and intermediate range, uh, on focused on Germany in particular, but on Europe, on all our bases in Europe. A lot of those were mobile. We didn't know the locations of a number of others. There was essentially no way for us to eliminate Russian ability to annihilate Europe by a US first strike. So they had Europe as hostage. And Khrushchev had thought earlier that was enough to neutralize our force. They were holding our allies hostage. Actually, in the estimates of that time, you find very little uh, consideration even of what would happen to Europe. The estimate just was what will happen in US and USSR and so forth. I say I wanted to uh, release information eventually. We're now talking, I jumped ahead here to 69, which is what Lynn asked me about. In 69, I thought at last I will release a lot of the information that I had presented to Bundy much earlier, in which I notes of mine, estimates, uh, programs of various kinds. And here were some of the things that I told him about and which I thought the public ought to know by that time. First, that our forces had always been essentially first strike forces. After all, in the late 40s, we had a monopoly uh, of nuclear weapons and expected it falsely to go on indefinitely. That was a delusion by uh, Truman and Groves, which I think almost any scientist could have disillusioned them of if it hadn't been so secret and they, hadn't, uh, and they had discussed it at all. But they thought they would have a monopoly for a considerable time, and for four years, of course, only. Uh, and in that light, our forces were built up uh, in NATO and so forth to destroy Russian cities in the event of war with a monopoly. That ended, as I say, in 49. But after the Russians got forces, immediately SAC then acquired hundreds and hundreds of new targets uh, in the USSR. Every airfield became a necessary target from which they might launch something against the US. And eventually, when they did finally get six, six uh, missiles, of course, all of those became targets for multiple hits. And above all, Moscow. Uh, I might mention by the way, that I could never quite understand then till now the emphasis in the Strategic Air Command on hitting Moscow as their number one target. Starting out with the notion that the Russians had a lot of missiles uh, that we couldn't find and that would, we could not destroy, to leave them without command didn't seem to me a, shall I say, prudent or, or let me just say sane thing to do, to uh, create a situation in which dozens, maybe hundreds, at sea, uh, and missiles elsewhere uh, were on their own, essentially, to uh, destroy things. How did you ever get the war ended? Uh, how could you talk of bargaining or prevailing or achieving tolerable terms when there was no one to bargain with on their side or probably on our side uh, with Washington gone? That has never made any sense to me. And to my knowledge, that has remained the, uh, the main um, objective, decapitation uh, in, a, in a general war from then till now. 
we could go into what the psychological or whatever reasons there might be for that. It is, of course, the one way conceivably you could paralyze uh, the other side and come out of a general war alive, survive it. It's the one way, really, that they ever thought could do that, and so that made it attractive, except that uh, it, it gave up any notion of what I, with my colleagues at RAND, had thought to try to install instead, which was a kind of control in general war. Obviously impossible if you're decapitating the other side and if they're doing that to you. But, so I would say that what I was doing, uh, along with what Bernard Brody or Herman Kahn or Albert Wilson thought of doing, uh, Bill Coffin at that time, was essentially infeasible uh, if, uh, in fact, there was to be no command system on the other side. Uh, to prevail with. But the other things, as I said, was the emphasis was always on first strike. Uh, not out of the blue, not a preventive war uh, ever. That had, was considered by Eisenhower but rejected in 1953, never really picked up by anyone. Uh, there were people, but really very few, like Curtis LeMay, I think, who did take that possibility seriously, but not otherwise. But a preemptive war as some people took it, going second first uh, on warning that the other side was attacking was the basis for our planning and the kinds of weapons that we built. Uh, likewise, the possible escalation of a limited conflict in Europe or elsewhere to a US first strike, as I say, not out of the blue, but as an escalation, hitting their military targets and incidentally, the cities that they were near. Oh, okay. so. Whereas at RAND, the, the focus was entirely on how do we prevent a Soviet first strike, which, as I've just said, was a, something we believed was a real worry, but was a delusion, basically. It was not a problem. It was a, a false problem, uh, which the Army and Navy somehow managed to perceive, but the Air Force, our sponsors, did not perceive until late in the game. But there were problems, and that was to keep the Russians out of West Europe or elsewhere, uh, by threatening that we would strike them first and limit our damage. So damage limiting was the main objective. And I know we'll talk with Lynn. I'm, uh, I know she's talked to SAC commanders like Russ Doherty, who I knew as a colonel uh, in the Pentagon in 60-61. Okay. Second, that it was not possible for the Soviets to decapitate the U.S. and paralyze our forces by an attack on Washington or other command posts because the president had very secretly delegated authority in such a case if Washington were hit or if communications were otherwise cut off with Washington uh, to launch weapons if they thought it appropriate. He had delegated this in writing to field commanders. That was a, a super secret and the fact that it was secret is something worthy of some questioning because uh, how, do you how do you deter the Russians from seeking to decapitate us if they don't know that the authority has been delegated? But it was afraid that uh, the president was afraid, I think with reason, that that would scare the American people too much, and we, were not, we did not tell the Russians that. The, our own plans for decapitating the Russians, which got increasingly public later in the uh, 70s, uh, under uh, actually Carter and uh, Ford and Reagan did stir the Russians, of course, into their dead hand system, their perimeter system, so that we couldn't paralyze them. In other words, essentially, not going into details here, pretty much what we'd done. Uh, so that, this, again, this decapitation uh, idea would not have worked on the Russian to paralyze them. Uh, the danger, though, involved in that and the possibility of false alarms seemed clear enough. And as I say in the book, and a lot of you have studied these false alarms, Bruce Blair, who was here for a long time, was he not? Uh, or not? No? Okay, but anyway, I, I heard him here once, I guess. Um, and uh, David Hoffman gave it a talk, I heard, on the dead hand in Russia. Um, okay, so we had this delegation, first strike, hitting cities in China. Um, and a number of other problems that I saw. Our, let me jump ahead because we're getting late here. I'll just say that as of 69, none of this had come out, and I thought that it was time that it did. So, having started long ago to answer 
uh, Lynn's question, I will now say it. I did copy those documents. I didn't have the actual war plans, but I had many verbatim uh, transcripts, paragraphs that I had copied from my own research and work that I was doing, and my own work and so forth. As much as the Pentagon Papers, actually thousands of pages, perhaps as much as seven or 8,000 pages. It so happens to make it brief, and I tell the story here. Uh, I, put, I decided that I would put those out after the Pentagon Papers had had a run, had had their effect, whatever they would, on the Vietnam War. As a friend of mine who was going to prison in draft resistance uh, told me just before he went to prison, I told him what I'd done, and he said, Dan, uh, don't put out the, what came to be known as the Pentagon Papers, the Vietnam Papers. We know enough about Vietnam. Uh, that's all out there. The nuclear is much more important. And I said, yes, it is more important. But Vietnam is where the bombs are falling right now. And uh, I want to do what I can. If I put out the nuclear, people will pay no attention to the Vietnam part. And the war will not be affected. So I'll do what I can on the, with the Pentagon Papers and put out the nuclear was afterwards. I had no doubt that the nuclear papers would certainly put me in prison for life. Uh, and the uh, Pentagon Papers probably w would do that. So uh, I was going either way. I gave the nuclear papers to my brother for safekeeping in New York. Uh, he moved them several times uh, for protection. And they ended up in a box, uh, or rather in a, in a box inside a green garbage bag in the town dump at Terrytown, uh, New York, underneath uh, to market uh, a large green iron stove that would show where they were. And that was above a bluff uh, in which he buried the papers on the side of a road. During my first trial in 71, uh, my brother informed me that a hurricane, Tropical Storm Doria, had hit that area in New York and had moved the stove about 100 yards. And the bluff had turned down over the cliff with its contents. Uh, couldn't find it. And even so, I, for the next year and a half, I really hoped that he would find them because he spent every weekend uh, with a friend uh, searching that dump, trying to, to see if they could turn up something. And I somehow assumed surely they will get it eventually. At one point, they, they hired a backhoe to turn dirt over and uh, found a lot of garbage bags, a thousand garbage bags, but none with top secret documents inside. And eventually, the fill from that uh, dump was used as fill for a condominium nearby, and they poured concrete over it. So I had to give up on that. And uh, people have asked me why I haven't put out this information, which is in this book. This book basically gives the contents of the other Pentagon Papers that I'd copied, as well as I can remember, which is pretty well because I told my lawyer uh, at the time what I had done, one lawyer only and uh, uh, had long transcripts uh, from that period as, as early as 71, which I, uh, I tried to publish in 75, as soon as the war had ended. Uh, I gave a lot of those transcripts. And my editor at that time and a larger publisher said, well, we'll send 1,400 copies of this, you know, history of nuclear weapons. And I said, all right, you know, that's one for every member of Congress. Good, and hard copy and uh, some journalists and some academics, that's fine. She said, no, that means we won't publish it. And in fact, uh, that's been true ever since. Uh, I've been lecturing on the subject. I've testified about it in, uh, in trials to no, under oath, uh, to no attention to anybody covering the trial. And in fact, this book was turned down by 17 publishers before Bloomsbury took it up. It's a, uh, nobody wants to read about nuclear war. Now, OK, that's a well, long, that's a, that's a, a that's long a answer to your question. That's a very full yeah. response to my question. And of course, that means we're going to have to change tack a little bit. So I'm going to ask you one more question, and then we'll open it up. OK. Uh, you can be somewhat fulsome in this answer if you'd like to be. Not as fulsome as you were. But when it comes to the audience, uh, you know, we'd like to have at least 20 questions, 15, 20. Okay. Yeah. So uh, uh, that will be Scott's pleasure to, uh, to uh, um, 
try to make you a little more succinct. Uh, and this is, of course, fascinating. So that has, the length has nothing to do with how incredibly interesting this is. So Dan, one of the things that struck me, and you didn't tell the story here, and it's just great in the book, and don't tell it here, is that when you got the number back from the Joint Chiefs of Staff, this was a set of questions you had written them, uh, and uh, one of the questions went out under the uh, under the president over the president's signature, and you were shown the answer. Yeah. We know that other civilians have also had overwhelming uh, moral reactions. Uh, 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 but I haven't. You do? Who would your name? Who comes to? Well, your I would like you from to the name, Pentagon. If you'd like to, okay. If if no, not the real question is. What shall I say? What's wrong with you? The, the question is, why did you have this reaction and very few others and no one in your position uh, had the kind of reaction that you've had? I mean, this is, in a sense, your life's work, making this known and understood. Um, why do you think it affected you in that way and not others? I don't know. Okay. That's succinct. That's succinct. Okay. <laughs> well, with that great run, I think Scott, I'll have you do the Q and A. Could could I comment on uh, something you raised? Of course. The question of has been in my mind is indeed. I've just turned lens around. How can it be that we've we public at large, have been living with this situation and tolerated it for more than half a century. Partly, they don't know, of course, uh, so they don't know. But how about the handful, the relatively handful of people who did know uh, what we were talking about? Lynn has given away a punchline here, in effect, uh, that I could have drawn, uh, come up to a little more systematically, but the issue is that when asked what, who would be killed if we went first in an escalation in Europe or a Berlin crisis or whatever, the answer was 325 million people in the USSR and China, but also 100 million in East Europe the captive nations from strikes on their airfields and their air defenses and their command and control, and 100 million in West Europe from the radioactive fallout from our strikes in the East without a single warhead landing on them, depending on which way the wind blew, which depended on the season to a large extent. But that meant that we contemplated killing collaterally and undesirably 100 million of our NATO allies. Now, actually, that's just what happened from our strike. And it was an underestimate, as Lynn, uh, more than anyone else, has shown, because they weren't figuring in fire, the main effect of thermonuclear weapons, uh, heat. And that would have added uh, several hundred million more to the casualties. So we're talking about a billion people from our strike out of a population of three billion. A third, and interestingly, by the way, I've heard Edward Teller say, and he said it more than once, the use of H-bombs, his baby, the thermonuclear weapons, uh, the father of the H-bomb, could not kill more than a quarter, or one might have said a third, of the Earth's population. The, the, I heard him say that, sort of the glass two-thirds full. Here, but, no. but, okay, the Russians then, in response, as I said, at that time, in early 61, might not have landed a single weapon on the U.S. There are four ICBMs. They might have had some submarines at sea with some capability. Might not, not. But they would have annihilated Europe, something that was not apparently a total deterrent to our carrying out our plans. So the question I've faced for 50 years is not actually, gee, why did this bother me? I mean, you know, the question I mean, that, that really didn't come into my mind. How can we have done this, and how could we this have persisted? It does persist, and a major thing in this book, I think, is to give attention, some would say 
more than it deserves, and I don't think so, to what was discovered 20 years later, which was that the major casualty producing effect of this kind of attack would not be the blast or the prompt radiation or the immediate heat and the immediate fires. It would be something that they didn't consider at all as an effect of the attacks. The smoke from the cities that were hit, that were burning, and specifically not just smoke in the lower atmosphere, but smoke that would be lofted by the nuclear attacks into the stratosphere where it would not rain out and where it would cover the globe um, quickly within days and uh, obstruct perhaps 70% of the sunlight creating, and this was the first thing people focused on, ice age conditions on the earth, frozen lakes, frozen rivers. But what is now emphasized much more in the last 10 years is killing all harvests for what turns out to be not one year as they thought at first, this is all their computers could handle, but over a decade. Meaning that nearly everyone would starve within a year or so from our attack or the Russian attack, or both together. And that in India, Pakistan, uh, uh, thing much, much lower, in, incomparably lower in size, 100 fission weapons only, would reduce sunlight by 7% instead of 70%, shorten harbor harvests, lower the food supply to a point where the 2 billion least nourished people on the planet would starve out of what is now 7 billion, 7.4 billion. So we had here, especially with the US and Russia, what could well be called, what Herman called, a doomsday machine. And um, the, as I say, even earlier, the notion that a billion people would be killed out of 3 billion would seem to be, you know, serious enough, let's just say. But we are talking about the Southern Hemisphere as well as the Northern Hemisphere, killing nearly everyone, not total extinction, because according to Alan Roebuck and Brian Toon, probably, probably some would survive, perhaps 1%, living on fish and mollusks in the Southern Hemisphere, in, in Australia or New Zealand. But everybody else would starve. The last point I'd like to make here and on this is there's a lot of talk here now about Trump's use, apparently conscious use, of what Nixon called a madman theory. The notion that he was unpredictable, impulsive, uh, irrational perhaps, up to a point where he might actually carry out the threats that we were making, the fire and fury threats and the other threats. I want to say that, in fact, not, it was not only Nixon who was making such threats in 1969 when I was copying these papers. Every president has relied on a threat of initiating nuclear war against Russians in Europe that would essentially lead either, what they didn't know was to the death of everybody, but to the death of a third of the population. In other words, it has always been, our NATO policy has always been, I would say, the threat and the preparations and the capability and the readiness to take actions under some circumstances that are insane, criminally insane, murderous to a scale that human language doesn't, doesn't comprehend. Doesn't, we could, this could never happen before. It was not an issue for the human species until the last 70 years. Dan, but for 70 years, we've had a madman policy, uh, and we still do. It didn't start with Trump. It doesn't. Our SAC forces constitute a doomsday machine on hair trigger alert, 10 minute alert, or less than that, as do the Russians. Uh, and the question is, is, is that in itself necessary, tolerable? I would say absolutely not, absolutely outrageous and uh, intolerable, but it's being tolerated and we're rebuilding on both sides those doomsday machines at the cost of hundreds of billions to trillions of dollars. So the question is, how can this be changed? It should be changed, I believe, uh, very much so. But how, we have not discovered. No one in this room, no one in the country that I've seen has discovered how to change this policy. Most of them are not aware of it. But those that have, like myself, have certainly not succeeded in changing this course under either Democrats 
or Republicans. So if it needs changing, it's up to us or people like us, I think, to try to think of how it might be done. Great. I want to go back to your first trips out to Omaha and to recognize that in 61, this is only 16 years uh, after the end of the Second World War, and the commanders and the staff people are the people who bombed Japan. Right. So to, to what degree, when you're looking back at this experience, did that experience color their views about nuclear weapons and their effectiveness politically? Can you talk about personally no, what it was like No, I think like it was uh, absolutely a good, good question. I'm glad you raised that. Um, I spent time researching uh, at that time and ever since that's expressed in several chapters of this book now uh, that aren't in most books on, or that may be alluded to on nuclear problems, but I think is essential. I don't think you can understand how we got where we are and how we've maintained it uh, without understanding our history you know, strategic bombing in World War II, and, and in particular, its evolution toward the Nazi and then RAF, British, practice of night fire bombing, indiscriminate destruction of civilians, which became part of our major mode in Germany toward the end of the war, but was our sole mode, essentially, from March on, uh, five months before Hiroshima in Japan. And in particular, I go in some detail to... LeMay, General LeMay's own account of the, an, an attack that he ordered on the night of March 9th, 10th, 1945 on Tokyo, which burned alive between 80,000 and 120,000 humans, dying very badly, actually, uh, burning alive. Many of them tried to take shelter in canals across Tokyo, but the canals were boiling. So thousands, some say tens of thousands, boiled to death. And the odor of burning human flesh was so strong that the f pilots at low altitude, hundreds of yards, were sickened by it and were vomiting. They had to put on their oxygen masks uh, to protect themselves from the odor of roasting humans that they had created. LeMay then went on to try to do the same thing in all of the other cities of Japan, 64, some say 67 cities, never got a firestorm going again, which we don't have time to go into it, but the peculiar thing, that a kind of fire which is caused generally by nuclear weapons, and only three times in a major way in World War II, a storm that creates a major updraft, which brings in winds, which feed it to a very high temperature, but also incends um, uh, what wasn't realized at the time sends the smoke into the stratosphere. Uh, and it was only three cities then, so it didn't cause nuclear winter. But uh, it's the same kind of phenomenon. It was caused in Hiroshima by a firestorm, not Nagasaki as it happens, um, and would be caused by most nuclear weapons. So I think without that experience of, as Herman, as um, uh, LeMay put it, to my colleague Sam Cohen, the father of the neutron bomb, he liked to be called, at Rand, who I knew very well. And Sam told me that LeMay had taken him aside at one meeting and said, Sam, war is killing people. You kill enough people and the other side quits. Now, it was that theory, I think, that led directly into our nuclear planning. And I would say one thing on Hiroshima that I think is rarely, rarely assumed. It's assumed that Hiroshima was a major moral and political decision at the high levels to be made, whether to use it or not, that is the atom bomb. Not so. Uh, it raised no moral questions that were new or significant that had not been answered by Truman. And that's the way he talked about it ever since. We had been trying to kill as many Japanese civilians as possible every day for five months before Hiroshima. And we killed figures that are given between 300,000 and 900,000. The US Strategic Bombing Survey gave 900,000. 300,000 is uh, also a figure that is, is used. Perhaps 600,000 Germans had been killed that way. So the point is, that had come to be the American way of war as far as Strategic Air Command was concerned. And they came to have the major budget in the armed forces. <laughs> 
later. So fitting nuclear weapons into that uh, was straightforward. It, it involved no new decision against cities. And then in the mid-50s, they took the same plans and fitted in the new H-bombs. And I'll just mention, and we'll go through it in this audience at all, but I'll tell you a, a little datum here. When I ask an audience of 500 or 1,000 people how many believe they know the difference between an A-bomb and an H-bomb, I expect three or four hands to be raised. And just to see if other people are being coy or modest, how many do not know? Everybody. Americans do not know the difference. Well, people here do know the difference. But of course, the difference was an explosive yield, not a destructive yield increase, but an explosive of a 1,000 times. And uh, so that's when we, we really acquired the doomsday capability, sort of inescapably, by the mid-50s. But something that just struck me recently, and I want to talk to Alan Roebuck about it, is this. Truman left Eisenhower an arsenal of about 1,000 fission weapons, nearly all targeted on Russian, Soviet cities, not yet so much China. A 1,000. You don't need a thermonuclear weapon to burn a city or to send the smoke into the stratosphere. That would have destroyed most life on Earth in 1952. When Eisenhower left office, he left it with 23,000 weapons, mostly thermonuclear, or at least half thermonuclear. Kennedy and Johnson got up to 37,000 nuclear weapons. Any of those doomsday machines. So uh, that's where we are. Sig Hacker, I've been here at CSAC for about 13, uh, 13 years. Uh, before that, I spent most of my professional career at Los Alamos National Laboratory, uh, including being director of Los Alamos National Laboratory. No. Uh, so the, the question that I have with the picture that you painted, you know, of what was there, I mean, it, it's really, you know, frightening. Why haven't we seen nuclear weapons being used? Why haven't we? Why have we not seen nuclear weapons being used since Hiroshima and Nagasaki? Uh, first of all, I would say, and this is not to evade your question, I'll, I'll get to what you mean, but I would say they have been used frequently, almost daily, with regards, as SAC will point out, or Strategic Command now, uh, in deterrence, in NATO, and so forth. But I'm thinking more specifically, they have been used dozens of times the way you use a gun when you point it at someone's head in a confrontation. Most of these times have been secret from the public. Uh, I'm sure you, you know a number of them, and possibly a number not. Uh, so closely held and compartmented, but the history is available now in Vietnam, in Indochina, in uh, the Middle East, and other cases, including Kuwait, interestingly, in 1958. Uh, they've been pointed. And a couple times by the Russians, including Suez, uh, when it was a total bluff by Khrushchev. He did not have the capability that he claimed to hit London and Tehran. He couldn't do it. But it was a bluff, and he, he felt, by the way, that it had been uh, successful. Uh, probably, probably not in that case. Just a footnote here. I just read from Naftali and uh, Fursenko's wonderful book on the Cold War that Khrushchev believed that his threats over Iraq and Kuwait in 1958 had been effective. I hadn't even ever heard of them before. But he was given the false impression that he had used them successfully at that point. Uh, Nixon, of course, was using them in 69. Both Kim Jong-un and Trump are using their weapons right now, I would say. Uh, and so we can come back to that. But why have none exploded? Uh, yes, I that's just the question you were. Say, I, I asked the wrong question. I should have asked that. <laughs> no. So why have they not uh, actually? Why have the threats not been carried out? And I think that's, by the way, not easy to know. We can only guess at it. We can speculate about it. In some cases, I've said they were bluffs. There was no capability, or perhaps in other cases, no intention to carry them out, whether they succeeded or not. Were they all bluffs? I don't think so, actually. So, in fact, uh, uh, a very good book by um, Evan Thomas on Eisenhower is based on the premise that he was always bluffing. Well, you read the record, I can't read it that way. I don't think he was in Komoi, Matsu, and in some other cases, bluffing. <laughs>
So then another reason, of course, is that there was only one superpower at, for a large part of this period. So that uh, when we made threats, I think, and say we had carried them out in Korea, uh, as Truman threatened and Eisenhower threatened, uh, would Russia have responded? I think very, very unlikely. But nevertheless, it is striking that Truman did not do it. I think it is noteworthy that uh, neither the Russians, when they lost in Afghanistan, uh, or the US when they failed in Vietnam or Korea with a stalemate, it is noteworthy that it didn't get used. I think the, the de in other words, deterrence certainly has an effect, a big effect. It can work. For that matter, I would have to say right now, probably rather uh, um, problematically, controversially, Trump could, as Moon is giving him, deserve, quote, credit if he were to get a deal, which, by the way, I hope you will be critical in achieving uh, in Korea. But if he gets a deal that nobody foresaw, his threats will almost surely have played a role in that, perhaps on China. The point is not that these threats can't work. I think they have worked in some cases. But that they are dangerous and that they preserve us in a posture which continues, which keeps us from effective action toward mutual disarmament it takes us out of the capability of being a leader, really, when we're making these threats and we're building these weapons. And the same is true of Russia and of the other nuclear states. But uh, the argument against them, then, is that the benefits they get in my mind, which can be real, are greatly outweighed by the risks of preserving this posture. So I think, in, other way, in short, deterrence has been a significant factor. And that, by the way, would be deterrence on both sides. In other words, if the Russians had not built nuclear weapons, if China had not built nuclear weapons, is it more or less likely that the world would have seen nuclear weapons used in Vietnam, for example, or elsewhere? Uh, I think we were deterred uh, to a significant degree. I myself can't bring myself to criticize China for deciding to get some nuclear weapons uh, from 64 on. Uh, faced with Russia and the U.S. as competitors. And a last point I'd like to make here, and we can talk about it more, is China is an example of a major power that went a very different route and pursued what I would say, if there is such a thing as a sane nuclear policy, as the movement put it back in the 50s, never defining that I remember what a sane nuclear policy would be, China's policy is close to a sane nuclear policy. No first use, no pretended capability to limit damage in a general war, no threat of first strike, first use, limited numbers against the U.S. in particular. They still, if they have 300, could be on the edge of causing nuclear winter. That's not too great. It's more than they need. North Korea can't. China can. But a Chinese policy with North Korean arsenals in the nuclear weapon states I would say, would make the world much, much safer than it is. My question is about uh, Israel nuclear capacity, U.S. relationship to that, and, um, and its potential mm -hmm. Well, uh, here's an inter it relates to the earlier question in an interesting way. I think it's noteworthy that the Israeli capability has not yet evoked a nuclear arms race in the Middle East. Uh, certainly, that seemed improbable to me and many other people, but it hasn't happened, interestingly. Everybody does predict, and I can believe them, that an Iranian capability would induce a nuclear arms race, perhaps. Okay, the different. Israel didn't, surprisingly, so they didn't pay that particular price. Second, what's the relation of their policy? Their policy, of course, has never been anything other than first use, first strike. They have not confronted a nuclear armed policy. So like us in the late 40s, their policy is strictly to deter or respond to a non-nuclear attack by initiating nuclear war. Now, uh, when, I, when I was Israel, actually speaking for a man who became my friend, uh, Mordecai Vanunu, um, uh, I remember saying, you know, my, in those days, what I'd always thought, I said, my father, uh, taught me to believe that Jews were smarter than other people. And the Israeli policy doesn't strike me as exemplifying that. But in retrospect, um, 
maybe not. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. They, uh, they have indeed deterred attack, from, especially from 70, you know, 67, 73. They limited it. And uh, they haven't, it's not clear, by the way, still how many weapons they actually have. The figure always given now is 80 based on something, and Sig probably knows why, or Perry. Uh, I know that Mordecai Vanunu back in the mid 80s was saying uh, that they had several hundred, he thought, with, with H bombs. I don't know. But if they have limited themselves down, okay, it's smarter than having more, I would say. Uh, what do they do with 80 nuclear bombs? Undoubtedly, some of them, according to Sam Cohen, uh, neutron bombs. He felt that his, his uh, doctrine had had greater receptivity in Israel and France than some other places. I don't know. But um, uh, okay, for, for tactical use and so forth, in the desert and so forth. Might make sense, but it certainly has subtracted Israel as Japan's alliance with us subtracts Japan from the ranks of those who might be strong forces for mutual disarmament against first use, against doomsday machines, against... Uh, by the way, I would like to see China, but I'm told politically it's not realistic, to say to the rest of the world, Here's what we do, and here's why we do it. And this is what, in our opinion, you should be doing. If the US and Russia were to adopt a posture like that of China, I think the world would be much, much safer than it is, or has been, or is going to be. Uh, and it would be fine with me if China exerted leadership on that and explained why, in part, by holding a worldwide conference on nuclear winter with experts, with people from nuclear uh, planning establishments and looking at it. But coming back to your point, I, I would have liked to see Israel to be a voice against nuclear weapons. Obviously, that is not the path they chose. The gentleman in the striped shirt here. I'm Mark Seiden from the Internet Archive and uh, CSAC affiliate. Um, it sounds like a lot of the uh, bugs you talk about in formulating these strategies have to do with um, somebody's cooked the numbers. The numbers are not being accurately reported from the people who gather them and believe in them. Numbers on what? Well, numbers on anything. Yeah, numbers right, of okay. missiles, numbers, numbers of warheads, yeah, right. the order of battle. You know, every number seems to be cooked at some point as it gets reported up the chain to leadership. And there must be perverse incentives in the intelligence uh, operation that causes this to happen. And that results in a perversion of strategy. Can you talk about... Anything you can think of to fix uh, yeah. that? Yeah. Um, I don't think it is an intelligence problem, primarily, on question of numbers. Uh, for one thing, since the satellites and the, we already had electronic intelligence, but even more of it now, but uh, the satellites in particular, I don't think there have been enormous disagreements on how many weapons the Russians have or how many we have and so forth. That was an earlier period. Now. When you talk about intelligence, interestingly, there are those who would say, well, it was a Cold War, and it was a natural mistake, and it was an error, you know, the missile gap and all that. Interestingly, the Army and Navy weren't subject to it. Uh, they were getting exactly the same data, same photographs, same e lint same everything as the Air Force. And they were saying a few ICBMs when the Air Force was saying hundreds going on thousands. So it's not a question simply of, well, looking back, I'm sure that some of the uh, Air Force people in particular were consciously exaggerating those figures. Uh, but on the other hand, the people I talked to uh, at the time weren't intelligence people, they were operations people, uh, did believe for sure that the Army and Navy were being treasonous. And that is the word they used and not as a joke. They are deliberately talking about they're having a few weapons when the reality is hundreds they're in, you know, they're jeopardizing the security of the United States, and they believe that very sincerely. Uh, let me let me add one thing to the uh, on that, which is in the book. Uh, when I was at SAC headquarters, when I was saying that Thomas Powers believed that they had a thousand. Now the Joint Chiefs had recently said to uh, 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 President Kennedy that if worst came to worst in Berlin, this is in '61, and General war ensued, we would lose at most 10 million people. 
That was an odd estimate, it seemed like. But that's what they did say. Looking back on it, I do think that some of them knew better than they were admitting that there were four ICBMs rather than what they were saying. But at the time, I said to the chief, the chief of war plans said, uh, they had a thousand, he thought, power thought. So I said, how many of those can we target? He said, about 200. So I said, hmm, 800 missiles we can't find, and your estimate is 10 million casualties? How does that fit together? So he said, Nothing for a long time. And then he said, it's a good question. He said, there's somebody I'd like to hear you ask that question of. So we went down into the bowels of sack, and I think the guy's name was Keegan. Uh, might, it might have been another one. I'm not sure. I did meet Keegan on another occasion. But the chief of intelligence for SAC. So I went through the same, same routine with him. And he said the same. So, hmm, good question. And... Uh, uh, you know, what about that? And so I said, well, you know, maybe if you're trying to stiffen the president's spine in Berlin, um, you know, that's, that, that estimate doesn't suit your purposes too well. And he, I'll never forget his answer. He said, are you saying we should fudge the estimates? <laughs> and I thought, oh, my goodness, no. You know, uh, since everybody in Washington knew that, that uh, the Air Force blew smoke on the estimates uh, every day. And I said, oh, no, but just if there's a range of uncertainty, perhaps you shouldn't just emphasize the upper range exclusively and so forth. We went out there. So there was a lot of bullshit going on. But, um, and I think the much more serious issue was one where the intelligence people agreed with the, uh, the politicians, and it's been true for the entire Cold War, and now we're getting back to it. And that is the estimate of the ambitions and the recklessness and the aims of our adversary, of the Soviet Union. Uh, the idea was that, very simply, it was said in all the estimates, their aim is from NSC 68, which isn't an estimate, but true on estimates, ever on. The Russians are dominated by ruthless, strong executives, people who want to rule the world. By mili non-military means if they can, but by military means if necessary. And what we're facing is Hitler with nuclear weapons. That's the issue. And that meant no negotiation is possible, no agreements will be kept. Um, you know, we're, we're facing somebody who is spending night and day trying to think of ways to exterminate us or to defeat us. Now, as they say, that turned out not to be the case. Uh, he hadn't built the missiles. Did that lead to a full reconsideration of our whole framework of the Cold War? Not even for one minute, as Ray Gartoff has reported. No one considered that at all. We're totally wrong about this, but no need to reconsider the whole framework here. It was too useful for some people, the Air Force, and let me give names here, Boeing, Raytheon, Grumman, uh, North American, um, to have an enemy that couldn't be negotiated with down and had to be matched or you had to be superior to. And we're getting back to that right now. And of course, we were hearing that with North Korea pretty much on a smaller scale until the president just changed the narrative, you know, uh, at this moment on North Korea. And I hope, I hope he sticks with it. But uh, the idea that you can't negotiate, remember, that's what Bolton has been saying and what Trump does say, well, until now, you know, can't negotiate, can't go down on agreements to ignoring the 1994 to 2002 agreement on plutonium or the possibility for an agreement that they were just ignoring it. And when, when Bill Perry has written about that, and you too, I believe, who are involved in that, you know, they just ignore it as though it had never happened. I think that's a very dangerous, and that goes beyond the intelligence service. They didn't, it wasn't coming from them really. It was just a necessary premise of building doomsday machines. I'm glad that you mentioned the Russians because the next question comes from David Holloway, so. Uh, David Holloway here at CSAC. Uh, my, actually, my question doesn't have to do with Russia. It has to do with Europe. It's the remark you made earlier and it's also in your book that um, the kind of Soviet retaliation against Western Europe was somehow didn't figure in uh, U.S. thinking about the consequences of a, a war with the Soviet Union. And I've also been very struck by that because on, certainly from the Soviet side, uh, 
they thought, oh, retaliation against NATO countries was, uh, I mean, Khrushchev thought this was absolutely vital and, and that it would have a deterrent effect on the United States. Um, but it's consistent, to my mind, through uh, U.S. thinking about the war that Europe tends to get left out when thinking about Soviet retaliation. And why is that the case? <laughs> well, I can't answer it, but I agree with you. I used to think, in fact, I may even have said in the book, I was ready to, that there were literally no estimates of the, of the casualties in Europe. At least I couldn't remember seeing one. But I said that to Bill Burr at the National Security Archive, and he kindly came up with a couple of references, not known at the time, but you know, uh, on Freedom of Information Act 20, 30 years later, there were some estimates of how many would die in Europe, which I didn't actually remember having seen. But uh, except, you know, just very elusively, a lot of people will die you know, and so forth. Um, you're right, as I said earlier, Khrushchev, I think, rather reasonably thought, look, I can wipe out Europe. How can they even think of initiating war against me within Berlin? Uh, it would be crazy. OK, I'll tell you my current perception of that. I think that, which is not common, uh, but I think there's evidence for it, and I can't prove it. I think that Kennedy himself was determined not to initiate nuclear war in Europe, period. And I will extend that not only in 61, in the Berlin crisis, but um, in particular in the Cuban Missile Crisis, having participated in that at the time, as did Bill Perry. We are almost the same age, and we were both uh, fighting above our weight, in a way, in the Cuban Missile Crisis. I was reading your wonderful memoir, and, um, and reading, my god, you were in Washington there at the same time I was there in the Pentagon, and about the same age, working on the, uh, he was just working particularly on interpreting the Russian missile uh, photographs and uh, estimates in Europe. And I was working on responses, you know, and uh, invasion plans and stuff like that. So my current estimate belief about that is, which was not the case at the time, is that neither Kennedy nor Khrushchev had any, deter any intention of carrying out their threats of going to armed conflict, that they were each bluffing. And uh, I didn't understand that at the time, and I would say most people have not accepted that notion ever since uh, for either of them. And yet, from what we now know, definitely did not know at the time about what was happening with US Navy destroyers dropping what they thought were mock depth charges on submarines who thought they were being bombed and were about to go down, and were ready to use the nuclear torpedoes that we didn't know they had. That was an intelligence failure there, didn't know there were any nuclear torpedoes in the Caribbean, and were uh, then other, other things that were going on in Cuba. I think we came within a hair's breadth of blowing the world up, and it didn't take the Russians. The Russians would have blown up Europe, but not the US. But the US would have starved to death within a year from the smoke from our own attacks on Russia. If, for example, a Navy destroyer or carrier, which was there, or cruiser, had suddenly gone up in an explosion, nuclear explosion, in near Cuba, in the Caribbean, which as far as we knew, had to come from Cuba. And the president had already said that any explosion from Cuba will lead to all-out war against the Soviet Union. Had the two people in charge of the submarine, uh, Savitsky and his second-in-command, uh, who wanted to use the torpedo, not been overruled by the commodore of the four submarines, Arkhipov, Vladimir Arkhipov, who hap Vasily Arkhipov, who happened to be on the ship, that particular ship, and who overruled them, we might not be here. So I'm saying that despite intent to, do, to carry out these threats, with the intent only to use them as threats, but not to carry them on, nevertheless, the guns almost went off and I think came quite close to it. I think that's also true in 1983, another whole story brought out by the National Security Archive. Uh, very important. And then there's these other false alarms like 95, where uh, Yeltsin is looking at his computer to see whether he should respond to a single attack. We don't know how close Yeltsin was in his mind. It's quite compatible with Yeltsin having said to himself, I'm not going to respond to that. So we may or may not have been close. But I'm saying 
In Cuba, we were close. And when Stanislav Petrov was told by all of his subordinates, you must report that we're under attack, and he chose instead to say, false alarm. That's why we're still here. So the, the world, I'd say, has hung on that thread. It is not as if either side was run by a Hitler with nuclear weapons. Expansionist, reckless, uh, insatiable. There hasn't been one of those since 45, to my knowledge, at the head of a major country. And that's why, in answer to Sig's question again, I think a major reason we're here, not just that nuclear weapons have not been used. Uh, but if the world had been the way we claimed it was for our adversary, or they claimed we were. Andropov, by the way, believed that Reagan was crazy and was going to have a first strike. That came out later. Well, uh, how could Reagan, Reagan of airport, Reagan the wonderful, and so forth. Uh, we've forgotten, I think, that Reagan did not look unlike Donald J. Trump at the time. And that's the way the Russians read him. This is Neil Snyder, a PhD student uh, and a military officer here to get his PhD. Thank, thank you. My, my question is, um, you've talked a lot about the flaws in our thinking in the early part of U.S. nuclear strategy, yet there are quite a few students of strategy out there that hold up the Eisenhower era, things like the Solarium Project and the rest of it, as idealized examples of how to do global strategic planning. So I guess my question is, how did, how did we get it so wrong? And do you have an explanation for why there's this continuing myth that the planning was that good in, at that time? Thank yeah, you. I, thank you for asking. I, I would like to know more from people in the system who were in it and who you know, were operating in it. I was in it. I believed Hitler with nuclear weapons. That's what I learned at Rand. Uh, so all of this made sense to me at the time, in the late 50s and early 60s. All I can say is I was 30 years old. I was just out of the Marine Corps. Um, but I'm, I'm glad I wasn't uh, making the decisions at that time. But how did we get it so wrong? Well, like the challenge that the Army-Navy estimates make to the Air Force estimates in 1959 and 60, you know, it was possible not to get it wrong. Um, Likewise, China's example, I think, should be seen as challenging to us. Uh, in 64 and 70, we knew they have only a handful of, uh, they were just getting ICBMs, and they had only a handful of first. And my memory, and I, was, uh, I left the system, per se, in uh, about 70, but um, uh, my impression was, well, they're very poor. They can't afford you know, a real nuclear capability the way we have, or the Russians have. Obviously, that has not been true in the last 30 years. They could, of course, have had uh, this capability, just as Japan, in effect, industrial universities could have it within years if they wanted to, or Germany, for that matter. And you know, other factors bear on that, why they haven't. But China uh, has clearly chosen a different path. I would say a much saner path that I would like to see, you know, and not just because they're poor. So. Um, I think I now see uh, what happened after the Cuban Missile Crisis as not inevitable in the following sense. Uh, first of all, I think that if Kennedy and Khrushchev had both stayed in office for some years after that, the world would be different, I believe. Uh, uh, I would hope we had a comprehensive test ban by that time. There would not have been the buildup that there was. Khrushchev was building up, but what was he building up to? A few hundred. ICBMs, not a thousand, not MIRV, etc. My understanding, and, and David would know this, uh, which I don't, but Bre my understanding is as simple as is that Brezhnev comes in in part with the support of the military against Khrushchev, and to make it very simple, says to the military, "You can have what you want from me." And what they wanted, this is my reading of it, is what the U.S. has, and they had just seen in Cuba, uh, the U.S. They had to back down in the Caribbean and in other ways. And my impression is, tell me if I'm wrong, that they attributed, the military attributed that in a significant degree, which we didn't, to our superiority in nuclear weapons. Now, looking back on it, it seems to me that they could have chosen to go the way China did. In 61, 
They had no type one deterrent, as Herman called. They had no deterrent. Four ICBMs. Europe, yes. But it turns out that wasn't enough, at least not enough to keep us from talking tough and staying in Berlin, amazingly enough, et cetera. So they needed more. Well, how much more? That's what you come down to, see. Did they need what we had? Did they need more? Did they need what? What is this? Did they need a doomsday machine? And the answer is no. I would say that was a terrific mistake from the point of view of world security. I'm not aware that it has done very much that you can point to for Russia ever to have that degree of parity, which is now installed as a necessity on both sides. Parity. Uh, I was very struck in your book, Bill, of when you said that uh, Carter said to you, we got to have parity, even when it comes to bombers. The bombers have got to be able to get through. You know? And so naturally, Secretary of Defense comes up with a way to get them through with their launch cruise missiles. Strategically, did we need parity, meaning everything they had or whatever they had or whatever? Do we need three legs on the triad? Uh, if I have one, if I wanted one thing to change, which, which I do, I mean, the top of my list of things I would want to change is to follow Bill Perry's repeated proposals to get rid of the land-based leg of the triad, to get rid of the ICBMs. I see them as the vulnerable hair trigger to the doomsday machine. And uh, I would be happy to have the Russians get rid of theirs, which seems less likely because they rely on them more than they do their submarines. But initially, I think the world would be safer and we would be safer if we got rid of those ICBMs, simply following the advice of the former Secretary of Defense. And I have to say, my hopes for having any change with a book like this or with the, what I'm saying, uh, how can I have more authority or more access or more attention or whatever than Secretary of Defense William Perry? Uh, but, and of course we should have gotten that. And Obama, as we understand it, was even in favor of that. As a matter of fact, there was a time back in 1991 when Ash Carter was in favor of it. But somehow in, uh, in 2016, uh, he runs into, uh, Obama runs into obstacles and opposition to no first use, to getting rid of air launch missiles, cruise missiles, but above all to the ICBMs that don't fit his priorities and he backs off from them. And that has been true of every president. So. Um, I still think that is a, a, it's a practical thing. Get rid of the ICBMs would be step one of dismantling the doomsday machines, which should be done, I believe. And I would like nothing better, uh, nothing, I, I would have hope if Secretary of Defense William Perry were brought in back, uh, at, even at our age, to the White House, rather than John Bolton. Now that's a, uh, that's a low bar, I understand, but uh, I, would feel, I would feel very good about that. But that's not where we're going, and if you come down to it, I do think the names I had are not just, I'm not just throwing out. I think that Boeing Corporation, which gets just a little less than the State Department in the current budget, $25 billion, and Lockheed and Raytheon are just, plus, uh, gee, uh, mine at North Dakota, would uh, uh, dwindle if we got rid of our Minuteman site there. Stuff like that. These are reasons for keeping a hair trigger that attract a lightning rod for attack on a doomsday machine? Well, yes, those are the reasons. And are they good? I don't think they stand up to public debate or scrutiny, but they're not getting that. Uh, let me ask here, how many people here have I'm not trying to embarrass you, have actually read this book yet, my, my book, The Doomsday Book. I see, oh, more than I thought, actually. But uh, how many have not? <laughs> OK, you're, you're with me here on these questions. Um, I will say that I would rather have the people in this audience read this book for what it's worth to you, what you find in it, whatever it is than the next five or 10,000 copies of selling that book. I would rather have it read here than sell another 10,000 copies. Dan Snyder. Yeah. Uh, Dan Snyder from uh, Asia Pacific Research Center. Uh, in your book, you have a really interesting chapter about nuclear weapons in Japan. And 
I wanted to ask you in Japan. In Japan, yes. Oh you, yeah, right. Yeah. Iwakuni, right. In Iwakuni, and I this uh, first revelation I've ever seen that we actually stationed nuclear weapons on the main islands of Japan. Well, not in, on the island, but a hundred yards offshore, two hundred yes. yards offshore. So we so did. What was in in U.S. nuclear war planning? What was the purpose <laughs> of the uh, not only those weapons, but also the ones that were thousands that were stored on Okinawa? And to what degree did yeah. the Japanese? know about this or simply uh, not want to know about it? Okay, good. Uh, I was just, okay. First, uh, ha having been a Marine and knowing that Marines are part of the Navy Department and often sail on ships, I spent about a year of my three years on ship duty uh, in the Mediterranean during the Suez Crisis and elsewhere. Marines have this friendly relationship with the Navy, so a Marine base at Iwakuni on the shore was able to make an arrangement with the Navy to have its own nuclear weapons just offshore. The Air Force inland, the Navy wouldn't have uh, you know, been interested in that. But having a landing ship tank just offshore at Iwakuni where it could on command and practice this frequently, come ashore, open its clamshell gates, which I came out of many times in landings, uh, mock landings, uh, and amphibious tractors would roll out that are already loaded with nuclear weapons, and they would go right to the airstrip, load them onto the planes, and the planes could take off. Hours before the Air Force could. Wonderful. You know, that's the way to start the war. And, uh, you know, not with a coordinated attack, but the Marines are first. As uh, I understand, I never thought of that angle, but I, I'm sure they liked that. Uh, my battalion, 3rd Battalion, 2nd Marines, I discovered, was first ashore at Tarawa. And when I discovered that, I put posters all over the battalion area. First ashore at Tarawa. Well, I've never, until your question, thought of this angle, but first bombing cities in Russia, you know, and so forth. Actually, the Marines probably, I don't know, they, they wouldn't even have known what the targets were, just coordinates. So military targets. Well, it was crazy to have them have their bombs a little before the KC-135s or whatever it was earlier, I think, on a storage plane, would come from Okinawa with bombs for the Air Force. And meanwhile, planes are taking off from carriers, cruise missiles from submarines. SAC planes are taking 8 to 10 hours to get there. But um, uh, tactical aircraft in Korea and elsewhere are, are hitting. So they wouldn't be actually necessarily the very first. But uh, to have them out of sync, you know, in this plan that was supposedly synchronized to the minute, which was a delusion, a hoax, uh, still was in their mind. That's what it was. So when I reported this to, as is in the book, I reported this to Paul Nitz, the Secretary of, uh, Assistant Secretary of Defense. He reported it to McNamara. And McNamara, actually, here's what happened coming earlier. McNamara's assistant for, Nash for nuclear weapons had a, a name, which I forget. It had a, loose, a big computer readout of every nuclear weapon in the world. So when this is reported to him from NHTSA, um, he looks in the book, and there's no weapons in Iwakuni. Nothing. And there's no LST there either. Then he looks into it further, and he discovers that the LST, the USS San Joaquin County, is home ported in Okinawa, which it went to every three years for refitting. The rest of the time, it's in the tidal waters of Japan as a target, as uh, something that frogmen can almost surely have exploded at any time, created quite interesting questions as uh, maybe a nuclear, a mushroom cloud. But anyway, the distribution of nuclear material, and it's 35 miles from Hiroshima. Anyway. OK, so it was a terrible thing. Everybody who knew about it said, this is terrible. But uh, Burke, the CNO, called NHTSA into his office. And there was a copy of my, you, you read this, a copy of my memo clearly in front of him, which was eyes only for NHTSA. And he says, what the hell are you doing telling the Navy where to put its ships? <laughs> and, so forth. and this is a ship that had been lied to, to, the, to Secretary McNamara. And um, so that's what made McNamara so mad initially that he'd been lied to about it. But he gave in. And, and as I tell in the book, what happened? The boat stayed there until 67, when Reischauer found out about it, the ambassador, uh, and demanded that it go back in 66. Uh, and uh, so it did go back. Why did McNamara allow that to remain from 61 to 66? Because he had other 
fish to fry, other struggles to go with, and he chose not to combat them on this. Just as, in the end, nothing really changed on the targeting of cities. Moscow remained targeted. And uh, virtually everything changed. The things that I had tried to put in, based on Rand colleagues in large part, except for the China thing. I had discovered this China issue of hitting China under all circumstances. The others hadn't seen plans in the Pacific. So that was my, my baby. And I was saying to my wife uh, about a year ago, you know, now I'm realizing nothing else that I tried to uh, put into the plans had any effect. As, as General Butler revealed, when he came in as the last commander of SAC, he discovers that instead of targeting cities, they're just targeting military targets in cities. So the cities are all burning. Moscow is burning. All this stuff, it made no difference. And this is 20 years later. But I said, except one thing, I think I probably did get China uh, off the list for immediate, immediate attack. Wrong. I learned from a, a SAC person, and I would love to have other people come in with stuff. But he sent me something that had recently been declassified called Project Furtherance. He said, do you know what furtherance is? No, never heard of it. In 1968, this, is, this I learned so late that it's not in the body of the book. I just learned it when I was writing notes at the end, so it's in the notes. I learned last year that, uh, putting this out the fall of last year, there was a meeting of everybody but the president in uh, November of 68, after the election of 68. Clifford is there, the Joint Chiefs are all there, Rostow is there, and they're deciding that we should, we should have a plan that doesn't hit China in the event of war with the Soviet Union. And I read that and I said, what are you saying? I changed that seven years ago. No, this was the plan for what you do if Washington is hit. Uh, and then you hit China, no matter who hit Washington and so forth. And, this was it. and they all agreed. Yes, this is a good thing to change. We should have two plans, one with China and one without China, and so forth. So it's very hard to change these. And I think it's not because, in answer, if I may address that last question uh, from the military man back there, it's not because no one has seen that this stuff is crazy. Actually, I was informed by people who thought that the Air, Air Force people, who thought the Air Force plan was insane and should be changed. And they were using me, in a way, to get through to, the, to bypass their own commanders, like uh, Arnold uh, and um, some of the others. White, White was the chief, or LeMay, to get through to the, uh, the white, uh, McNamara on this issue. And presidents have thought it was crazy. Obama wanted to change it. But none of them gave it high priority, priority that overrode other priorities they had. It wasn't worth the fight. And they had other, other things, no question. They were very important. But given the obstacles, and the obstacles are Air Force roles, uh, Navy roles now, in particular the new super fuses that Ted Postel has, uh, has written about. Uh, what are those for? I'm saying, yes, they improve our ability to destroy ICBMs and hardened command centers. To what effect? A, their sub-launch missiles still wipe us out, just with blast and radioactivity. And our own, our own attacks wipe everybody out. So I'm saying that the counterforce, damage limiting, hard, uh, accurate, fast missiles and all that that we've been building very profitably for half a century constitute a hoax. There isn't going to be damage limitation in a war between the US and Russia. It isn't going to make any difference whether you go first or second. It isn't going to make any difference which targets you want. As long as you hit several hundred cities, which they plan to do, it's not going to make any difference. So everybody understands, uh, everybody, almost everybody understands, thanks to scientists, that the ABM program is a profitable hoax, a jobs program. We, I think that's widely understood. I'm saying something that I think isn't so widely understood. The counterforce mission, the saving lives in America by hitting their ICBMs, is also a hoax, just as much of a hoax. Uh, it's not going to make any difference. 
but it is profitable, and it is just the, as the ABM is. And uh, it's, it's worth making this stuff, and also keeps our alliances by investing, by proposing to Japan and South Korea and others, we will go first, or Poland, or Lithuania, that we will initiate nuclear war, as we're committed to do, if needed, against Russia. That's insane. That would be insane to carry it out. But the threat isn't necessarily insane. It serves various purposes, including profit and our alliances and so forth. But the risk of carrying it out, I would say, is insane in comparison to whatever benefits it does achieve. So uh, uh, that's what I'm hoping, why I hope that people here may, may get some things, as you did from this, to show the risks we've been taking all this time for benefits that aren't remotely worth it. With apologies for those people who did not have a chance to ask their questions, uh, I think we do have to bring this to a close. So please join me in thanking Dan Ellsworth. <laughs>